Welcome, everyone, to episode 18 of Caster Calls with Zombie Grub. I am here with Zeph, who might be a little bit of an unfamiliar name for you if you're not watching a lot of Australian stuff, but she's actually been around, I feel like, about as long as I have, which, in the grand scheme of things, is basically the beginning of StarCraft II. At the time, maybe it didn't feel that way, but yeah, grand scheme of things, we've been around a long time, um, and you're still casting to this day, so you're going to get familiar with her, guys. I'm really excited to have you. Another Australian on the podcast is always fun to have. Thank you so much for joining me. How are you doing this uh, fine morning, I guess, in Australia time? I'm doing well. It's a nice day out. I'm keen to have a chat with you. We don't get to hang out that often. It's been a long time <laughs> since we've even got to cast anything together. So, yeah, it's a, a good way to spend your day for sure on a weekend. And, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm very... Uh, privilege to be on here because i've been watching a lot of the episodes myself i quite enjoy getting the insights from from other people as well awesome yeah i mean so far i haven't gotten anyone coming back after the show and being like actually that was like super boring i really wish i didn't do the <laughs> podcast so uh it sounds like people like talking about casting which is always nice very easy thing for us to do and that's why these episodes always go on towards the latter end of the 60 to 90 minute spectrum i always tell people <laughs> So let's uh, start off with, like, who is Zeph, right? Because you have been around for so long, but you're doing basically a lot of events that are on the other side of the world for a lot of the main audience, mm. which is mostly America. So when did you start getting into StarCraft II casting? And I guess, where would people, like, recognize you from? Um, yeah, so I started casting, I think, in 2011, maybe towards the end of that year. Honestly, I can I can barely remember. It was so long ago. Um, but I just started off casting local events. So we mostly had online events back then. Um, there are only like a couple of casters that really sort of covered everything. Um, and I was just lucky enough to join one of them, uh, when one of the casters who used to live in Singapore went back to the U S. Um, so I just kind of slid in there and started doing some of the online events. Um, and I guess just being such a small region, we don't have that many casters. And I feel like it was a lot of right place, right time. Um, and I ended up getting picked up for a few of the lands. We used to have a, a tournament circuit called ACL. Um, and they did lands in like, uh, I think primarily Sydney and Melbourne. I think they might have done one in, in Brisbane as well. Um, but that was like our only kind of consistent uh quote unquote live event. I mean it was very, very, very grassroots back then, very sort of chopped and chopped together and uh, a bit rough around the edges, but that's what we had. Um and the guys that worked with ASL uh, ACL eventually kind of became the guys that now work at ESL and uh run a lot of the the StarCraft stuff in the region. So one thing kind of led to another and um we were running uh, WCS qualifiers and stuff out of the ESL studio. So I just kind of ended up getting the call in for, for all of those as well. So um, as far as where people would know me from, I guess if they've ever watched the qualifiers for uh, Southeast Asia and Oceania um, for WCS and now EPT, that's usually where I do most of my work. I think that's where a lot of people recognize you now. I feel like with the consistent online production and the literal like 16 hours total of broadcast time, five yeah. days a week for StarCraft 2 right now, um, basically everyone is starting to get a little bit more recognition. It feels like StarCraft 2 is constantly on people's minds. And I don't know, I feel like lately I've gotten a lot, or I've seen, because you know, I'll wake up early enough to watch you guys a little bit before I come on for the, the European broadcast. And I feel like I see a lot more of like, oh, who's this chick? Oh, I really want that other chick, you know? <laughs> like, cause yes. it's always a comparison between us. So I, I feel like it's it's actually growing, which is it's kind of unique uh, for you. So as far as I understand, and you know, feel free to elaborate, is that uh, you were pretty into StarCraft too, of course, when it came out, like many other people, but as time went on, basically you did adult things. You went and got a job and you have a full-time career. So your options for casting, you know, especially outside of Australian time zones, is actually quite limited. Yet, with, I guess, everything that's going on right now, it actually feels like you were getting more popular, <laughs> you know, 10 years down the line, as opposed to, I don't know, what could have could have been uh, 10 years uh, before. But am I wrong? Do you, you do have a full-time job, right? And that's kind of limiting you. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I was uh, doing most of my casting when I was in university. 
Um, I studied computer science, so I was around computers all the time. Anyway, it was kind of like the best nerd life that I was living. So I had a lot of free time. Um, that's when I got to work with you on base trade and stuff. And I, I had a lot more time. We had some like monthly cups going on at ESL. Um, and I could just sort of pop in and guest cast here and there as well on streams. Um, so I was definitely doing way more casting back then on top of the WCS circuits. But yeah, as soon as I graduated, um, I never actually gave it much thought. I was like, oh, so I don't just keep going to school for my whole life. I guess I should get a job. So I ended up going into um, uh, IT jobs. Um, I was a software developer. Now I work in cybersecurity and it's a nine to five desk job. <laughs> so um, and I, I don't live close to where I work, which is in the city. So I have a long commute. That means I got to get up early and go to bed at a responsible time and not not exist on nerd hours. And that really ruined my ability to cast other things because I can't be up at midnight, 1 a.m. commentating StarCraft if I've got to go to work in the morning. Um, and that put that put an end to, to base trade and everything um, because I just couldn't participate like I used to be able to for a lot of the NA events because I could get up for those. Um, Europe was basically the only region I couldn't really touch. And even Korea with the time zone difference, it's usually only an hour or two, but it's enough for me to not actually be able to reliably sign up for a cast and say, yep, I can definitely do this and not be destroyed the next day at work. Um, so yeah, it, it's not ideal. I feel like I have a very strange casting career because of it. Cause at best, like, I, I don't think I can even call myself a part-time caster most of the time. Um, even I think last year when there was the changeover between Blizzard and ESL on who's running the circuit, there was like eight months where I didn't cast a single event maybe eight or nine months and I actually thought at that point like maybe that's it for me maybe I'm done because if there's just no work then I I'm so limited that I can't really jump into anything else and let's be real like I can't just put my hand up for EPT and A and be like hey guys hire me when there's already such like a stellar lineup for that so yeah, yeah. It, it does make it a little difficult and that's why I think a lot of people are like sorry Zeph who literally <laughs> they're not sure because I, I see it a lot when I I don't tend to keep Twitch chat open but especially at the start of the broadcast just before I've closed it I'd be like I see the comments like is this zombie grub she sounds different <laughs> yeah I can't I can't understand that I mean it yeah. was like I, I guess it was one thing when you know when I was coming in it was always is that scarlet because again like only one woman ever existed in Starcraft yeah <laughs> But, you know, I mean, like, I don't think we sound alike at all, like no. at all. But then people are comparing me to a person who literally has an Australian accent. And I'm like, how? <laughs> this is like the, the opposite, the very opposite. But it, it happens, I guess. Um, so, yeah, you I mean, I, I remember that time period. and it, it makes sense. Like there really was a time where Australian casters basically weren't. And I don't mean to put it harshly, but they weren't needed. Uh, like it was being mm. covered by a lot of other people and during more prime time hours as well. Um, so like for Challenger, right? Like they wanted to, of course, have eight to five California time. So yeah, I was like kind of wondering like, oh, is Zeph like just not doing very much anymore? But it makes sense that you weren't, there wasn't a lot to do actually. Um, although I know the Australian scene has actually been uh, very strong grassroots basically the entire time which is something that we might get into a little bit later. Mm. But um, in general, you've tried to keep up with StarCraft. You know, you're always in people's streams, so I was watching Maynard's stream, I know that much. And uh, <laughs> assuming that nothing broke, I was about to say, like, um, is it a conscious effort to actually stay with the StarCraft scene, or is it just something that you actually really enjoy? Oh my god, it is a conscious effort. I cannot tell you. <laughs> I mean, look, I, I'm like, I, I think a lot of people where your passion kind of ebbs and flows. There's a lot of passion lords where that just doesn't happen. Um, but because I have limited time to allocate to StarCraft um, and StarCraft requires your brain so much. I'm not always just awake enough to pay attention and keep up with everything. Um, when I'm really in the mood for StarCraft, it's great. I'm watching all the VODs. I'm keeping up with GSL when it's live. I'm, I'm watching a lot more streams and stuff. But, um, you know, if I, I get busy or I've just been really tired or something, it slips a little bit. And then it's like two months of the meta disappears on me. And then I have a cast come up. I'm like, oh, God, I've got to figure out a way to sort of 
um, get the Spark Notes version of the last two, three months and figure out what's going on. And uh, it's, it's a thing that I very much have to schedule into my life, I find. Um, so to be like, come home from work, chill for half an hour, eat dinner, and then bam, onto the StarCraft VODs and stuff. Um, but it tends to be more of an effort in the lead up to an event because I know I've got to um, get good, basically, and you know know what's actually going on so I don't do a disastrous, disastrous show. Um, so yeah, I think, I think it is definitely a conscious effort sometimes. Um, I think even during the EPT season, because there's so much content, I cannot keep up with all the regions. I mean, I get to cover three, mm -hmm. which makes it easy, but I don't get to watch all of NA and all of EU and, um, Korea, you know, I might only see a GSL here and there. So I feel like I still miss out on a lot of Starcraft and I, it, it wears on me a little bit because I'm like, ah, oh, you know, what if I'm missing something really important? like um Neeb invented a really cool new build and everyone's talking about it everyone knows what it is and then I hop on a car someone's doing the knee build and I don't know what it is <laughs> like that's that sort of stuff stresses me out but there's only so much you can do I guess in terms of keeping up with Starcraft yeah I mean that is actually what it is like it, it is so difficult to keep up with Starcraft even when you're like 24 7 on it like um you know, I, I do quite a bit just the nature of, of what I'm doing. Mm. So um, I like cast Wednesday and then I cast Friday. And literally that Thursday, I had to go back and watch the VODs of that Thursday. And I remember I watched uh, Marine Lord versus a Protoss and he did like a one base cheese. And then I saw it on Friday and I didn't remember it. <laughs> yeah. I literally watched the VOD trying to make sure I didn't have that moment of something that was only like 24 hours between both of my casts. And I forgot it. So when someone mentioned it in chat, oh my god, did they even watch okay when they're not casting? I was like all oh, the time. Right, okay. Uh and I mentioned it like in the in the next game or whatever, but it's it's kind of impossible. Um and it really that that stuff too, I feel like lends to that guy in the internet. You know what I mean? Like the guy who's like, I can't believe they don't know that one thing that happened. And you're like, Do you know 90% of everything else though? Like, I feel yeah. like, oh, it's it's so easy, even as like a commentator watching another commentator sometimes, it is kind of easy to be like, I knew where that build was. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. exactly, yeah. exactly. I mean, I got it the other day um, on a rare moment where I had the misjudgment of having Twitch chat open. Um, we were cast in EPT, I think, was I on a break? I don't remember. I was going to Twitch chat for some reason. And uh uh, in the cast, Maynard asked me what I thought of the the newer maps, and I hadn't been laddering a lot, and I said something to that effect of like, oh, I haven't really laddered too much in the past few weeks, um, so I don't have much of a personal opinion on how I feel about the maps. Um, but, you know, he's, he's what I think in a wishy-washy fashion, and there was a kid yeah. in the chat like, oh, it's so sad that casters don't even play the game that they're, they're um casting four and people in chat were like getting on him like what are you talking about dude like all, all the casters play um and they were like fine name name three commentators that don't play the game and he was like struggling out a few answers he's like well uh uh tasteless and uh <laughs> uh zef and i'm like <laughs> i was like oh all right, all right, hold on hold on i play the game He's like, you just said you don't play it. And I said, I haven't played in the last three weeks. You know why? Because I've been casting three PT regions. God damn it. I don't have time to ladder. Ah, it's so annoying. There's, there's always one. That's why I don't open Twitch chat because I just get baited. That is actually, I mean, it's a pretty big problem. I really don't like having Twitch chat open on the bigger streams, but I, you know, I'm well known, I guess, for being kind of a shitter in Twitch chat otherwise. <laughs> after like 15k I, I don't find it like worth it but um before it's like generally like i find it to be okay-ish and i've really been using the block feature recently so whether i know it or not if there's actually people being shutters in chat to me i don't actually know i probably blocked them a while ago so it's starting yeah. to prune that's the way to go <laughs> yeah but it, it is a bad idea usually because there is that just like a one thing that is just oh it's so hard to account for and that's actually been a stressor um i don't know if you you know experience this as well because you also do very long casts and you do a lot of work even if it's uh not over the entire four weeks uh for some of the rest of the guys but 
man, like, you know, st- casting is stressful in general because whether it's for two hours or eight hours, you're at the constant scrutiny of anything you say. And people should know. It's kind of like, I feel like a common thing to be like, yeah, speaking is hard for a long period of time. You know, speaking is not very popular. Public speaking is not a very popular subject. But now it's like, it is like eight hours repetitively mm. of being scrutinized. And, uh, there's even more StarCraft to watch, right? You you go to an event, you're there for four days, you watch all the StarCraft that happens because there's nothing else to do. For this EPT thing, it's like five days for four weeks, so 20 days. Yeah, good <laughs> that you luck. have to keep up with, and you're not <laughs> casting everything. You're not being paid to actually watch everything, right? So um, yeah, that's pretty insane. But it, it sounds like you've kind of met like at least a middle ground, right? I mean, not paying attention to Twitch chat always helps, but it sounds like you actually have at least a method to uh brush up on starcraft so what is that method i mean is it really just hardcore vod watching uh to a degree um it depends how much starcraft i've gotten to watch in the time leading up to uh the matches i think um it's definitely harder when a new patch has just dropped maybe a a week or two beforehand or something like that and i'm sort of scrambling to figure out what this means for the current meta um but yeah it is it is a lot of vod watching um i have the good fortune of basically always covering the same region and the same players so i have a lot of inherent knowledge um about a player's history when it's from this region specifically southeast asia and oceania because that's what i've done since forever um so it's a lot easier for me to pick out things that have changed in their play style or, you know, if they're doing well, if they're doing poorly. A lot of my preparation does tend to focus around the players and how they're doing and their matchups, their strengths, who their biggest rivals in the bracket are. Um, Because that's kind of like the angle I like to bring, especially in this region where a lot of the players aren't that well known on the international stage. And this is like the chance you get to showcase that. Um, But yeah, a bit of VOD watching on top of that, especially with players I'm not familiar with. I've had to do a bit of that for Taiwan. Hong Kong and China because I don't always catch matches from those players um but aside from that I tend to lean a little bit on some of the pro players or higher level players in the region that I'm friends with so like I'll go bother probe if I'm desperate I'm like please I don't understand pvp can you help me um and usually they'll write me something to sort of help me figure out you know what certain things mean in the matchup because I don't I don't always know so it's a lot of the time I'm just really trying desperately to not sound dumb because there's some matchups that I really struggle with. PvP tends to be one of them and TVT would be the other one where I just I really struggle any <laughs> coherent analytical thought. Um, it just it's it's such a difficult thing to come out with. So that's where I tend to lean on other people a little bit more to be like, hey, can you just sort of coach me through this a little bit so that Hopefully I don't say too many silly things in the cast. So yeah, that's pr- probably in a nutshell what my preparation looks like. Uh, do you depend a lot on, uh, I mean, do you talk to your co-casters? Because I mean, it is usually Maynard and Pig, right? Um, mm. Do you ask them or, or lean on them during the cast? Not so much. Um, I will ping Maynard from time to time and just be like, hey, do you know anything about this guy? Or maybe... Um, that tends to happen a little bit more in the breaks between matches. So we've got two players coming up and I'll be like, oh, I know this about this guy and that about that guy. Um, but that's about it. Do you, you know, is there anything that that you can add or anything? Um, but truth be told, I don't have all that much contact with Pig and Maynard outside of casting. I think I don't really, um, first of all, like they know what they're doing. It's more that I need to catch up. And second of all, you know, like they're, they're very busy. They've got streaming schedules and stuff. So I don't really want to um, inject myself into their timetable. Like, please, please help. <laughs> I, need, I need preparation. If it was a bigger event, like we were actually doing like live events or something, then sure, I'd be probably looking to at least have a chat with them beforehand. But yeah, not, not so much. Uh, I mean, speaking of live events, have you done? I mean, I know you've gone to studio broadcasts. Um, how many are we talking in all, all Australia, or is there anything else I'm missing? They've all been here. Um, I've had a couple of opportunities for random tournaments to go overseas, but it just, I mean, I was working and stuff, so it didn't really um, pan out for me. But um, 
Uh, that's a good question, actually. Uh, most of the live events actually probably happened towards the start of when I was casting around 2012 onwards with the ACL circuit. That's probably the closest thing to um, live events where um, you're not just tucked away in a corner and your voice is going out to the audience, but you're not actually physically present and people aren't watching you directly. Um, so there, there would have been like two or three back then. But the most recent one would have been uh, we had IEM in Sydney for CSGO and the guys organized to have um, the guys being Blizzard and ESL, I think, um, organized to have our WCS qualifier at IEM. So we had an actual stage. Um, we were casting behind the stage. But um, we were also doing player interviews, which they just kind of threw on us on the day. Like, by the way, you're doing stage interviews as well. Have fun. So that's probably the last time I actually had to stand up in front of people and physically do a thing, which was kind of awkward. Because um, this is actually something that Gillyweed touched on when she was talking to you about, like, what do you do with your body um, <laughs> when you're up there? Because I have um, actually, like, a, a, a quite a big fear of public speaking but um casting's like a a good way to get over that but i realized i still had that fear when i stood up and tried to interview someone on stage and i was trying really hard to hold the microphone still because i was shaking and i was trying to not like shake it in their face while they're trying to talk <laughs> and um but yeah yeah in terms of actually being live and in front of people it's pretty rare now i i'm not sure if that might happen again i hope it does um because we're lacking a lot of live events here but yeah it's been a long time I mean, even outside of, you know, the COVID years, um, yeah, yeah, Australia is not usually the the hot spot. I mean, it was always, I think if everything had gone according to plan and maybe like the EPT non-COVID was like a big success, then maybe Australia was being considered because as you know, I mentioned before and big grassroots, very uh, passionate community. I know like Apollo, I think kind of like talked about, touched on wanting to bring it there, but um, well, now we'll never know what happens, I guess. Yeah. But it would be awesome to have an IAM there. I'd love personally to go back if, you know, if I was hired. But um, yeah, that the whole like uh, casting and public speaking thing really is different, isn't it? Like I started to kind of get over my fear of public speaking in high school. I just had like very good teachers, um, but uh, of course, shy, awkward nerd. I'm not like you know amazing at it. Yeah. But casting, it just felt like it wasn't public speaking. It just was like talking about something that you like. So it was an easy way for me to get used to to that. But even then, I like I didn't want to use a webcam when I first was casting because I didn't want people like to judge my, my, my face basically. But uh, I do think that while, you know, you probably be, you know, you're comfortable on a casting desk casting with your co-caster. I got to say that interviewing and hosting is just straight up different, like in general, anyways, like that it, in itself is nerve wracking, much less in front of, <laughs> you know, hundreds of people, uh, a crowd of people. So uh, kudos to actually doing a, going up and doing that because worst case scenario you could have been like nope 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 and like yeah. <laughs> left the building um that you actually like uh it brought the courage to do it which is pretty sick uh how often would that happen i mean you're talking some of that that grassroots scene like starcraft 2 basically was overall back in 2010 2011 how often did you find yourself just like you know doing multiple jobs and getting all these things thrown at you at last second um I mean, it still kind of happens to a degree. Um, it doesn't happen that often, I think, because when we're doing those StarCraft events, it's always the same people working it for the most part. Um, sometimes the staff is a little bit different in terms of who's doing graphics and sound and stuff um, in, the, in the background. But, you know, I'm always working with a handful of people, same observer, you know, Maynard and Pig and... Uh, for a while, it was Moonglade and Death as well. We're all mates. It's really easy. So when people say, by the way, you're hosting, it's not as daunting as it would be if someone put me on an actual like WCS EU or EPT EU broadcast and went like, by the way, you're hosting, I would 100% panic. But um, yeah, I think it helps that we've got sort of like a small group that are basically always part of the event. Um, so when someone throws you that curveball of like, oh, we're thinking of doing player interviews, um, you do get a bit of an opportunity to say, well, maybe that's not a great idea or just be like, yep, okay, whatever. Um, I think it's not, um, it's not too bad. It doesn't happen that often because again, we're not doing that many live events, but, um, yeah, I think 
just because we always work together, they kind of let us do our thing. There's a lot less trying to allocate roles to people and be like, you're the host, your analysis, your play by play. There's nothing, no division like that. So um, yeah, it's mostly those live events where that sort of thing might happen where they just kind of, they want to add some flavor to it, um, do something a little bit different and take advantage of the fact that we're physically present for a change and get some of the players actually up there and hopefully showing a bit of their personality. But as you probably well know, players aren't always the easiest people to interview either. Um, yeah. <laughs> no. And that doesn't help the whole process of like, you know, um, interviewing is already a bit difficult. You kind of, you know, you're an amateur at it. You want to do first times and mm-hmm. then you know, and the player is just like, yes, yes. And you're like, oh my God, please say more things. Um, yeah, it can be really tough. A entirely different role uh, for sure. But one that I think is, I think basically if you can take a little bit out of uh, every role, it becomes, you know, you become a better analyst, you become a better play-by-play if you do try hosting, if you do try interviewing and all that stuff. So I hated it when I first got kind of like the whole surprise we're doing an interview because I'm even talking like, you know, back on base trade TV when we're yeah. going to get really excited and be like, I'm going to bring them on. I'm just like, oh, God, I suck at interview. I don't want to say anything. Oh, come on. <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to do it then, but now that, I'm trying yeah. to like, I'm trying to like leap into things, you know, so even if I fail horribly, it's a good, it's a laughing with me, not at me. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> yeah, no, that makes sense. Cause I have the same thing even now when they want to bring people on for the cast, um, for, for the interview. And I'm like, oh God, now I have to think of like worthwhile questions rather than how do you feel? It's like, well, <laughs> that doesn't really add a lot of value, does it? Um, but I get, I think I just get caught up with it. I think you just need to go with the flow and, and, you know, if you know you're doing an interview ahead of time, obviously that helps because you can make note of things during the game. Um, but even things like they, they wanted to do uh, this season, maybe some interviews with the winners in Taiwan, Hong Kong and China, but we have a language barrier problem there. We don't have a translator. So I think they reached out to the players and said, if you would be open to an interview, if you, if you win, please let us know. Um, it will be in English though. And I think only one or two players were ever like, yeah, yeah, I'd be open to it. But then it made me nervous because I'm like, what if I'm asking a question and they're having trouble understanding me, whether it's my accent or, um, you know, the, the way I phrased it or whatever. Um, so I start stressing about stupid things. Like it really doesn't matter. You know, they they get on, they have a go. That's the main thing. People get to hear from the player. Um, but I guess in my head, I'm like, oh, got to do a good job. I can't mess this up. I can't mess this up. And so, um, I make it into a thing that's bigger than it actually is. But yeah, I mean, with practice, right. You, you, you'll always get better. So, um, sometimes it's nice to go into the deep end like that. (laughs) Honestly, I feel like, uh, yeah, obviously practice like in general is going to be, you know, better for everything, but also I feel like with practice comes a lot more just flexibility. You just, you do become more casual with it. You do become more willing to laugh things off and even if you were kind of asking still awkward questions you, know, you kind of uh, mentioned it a while back but you said that you actually had some opportunities to maybe go to some other events but but work kept you back i mean is it can you talk about what opportunities they are or it's i can like they super- weren't they weren't anything like blizzard affiliated or anything um they were just random tournaments honestly i can't even remember what the tournaments were at this point but there was one where they wanted us to go to uh Singapore and there was another one where they wanted people to go to Japan that one ended up falling through anyway but the Singapore one I think in Sano our observer actually ended up going as a commentator and someone else um again I can't remember what event it was for but um those opportunities tend to still stick very much in the region it's like someone you know in, in when Starcraft is doing really hype they throw a whole bunch of money at a tournament in their local area and then they need someone to cover it they don't really care who or how they just they want to have something going on there and you know maybe get some sponsors some slots and make everybody happy so yeah they weren't like big premiere events or anything but um yeah they're just cool little things that came along i don't think anything like that's popped up in a long while here it's mostly um all ept stuff at the moment yeah, I know the um, I know Singapore uh, is actually kind of talking about I say Singapore like a whole country, but <laughs> a couple of players from Singapore were like really they really wanted to make something. But you know, obviously it's very difficult to do. So I, but it's still cool. Like it would have been a cool opportunity. Um, I know Australia is basically in the middle of nowhere, but I would also have loved to have gone to Singapore or Japan. That would have been amazing opportunities. Yeah. 
back in the days of being in university and kind of doing this casually, but like a decent amount, uh, I know you and Maynard uh, eventually became actually a very, maybe prominent, not exactly the right word, because that was, that was back in the days of like 15 top commentators, right? Yeah. That like probably weren't going to nudge out. So it's, it was hard to beat for sure. But yeah, you and Maynard did become a pair, um, and you guys won the casting tournament. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Gosh, yeah, that was a while ago. It was uh, day nine, so you think you can cast thing, and I think it was an up and coming uh, casting tournament just to sort of like show what you got kind of thing. I have no idea why we entered it. I think it was just because we were like, we could smash these nerds. <laughs> we just got like <laughs> cocky. We we're like, yeah, yeah, let's do it. Um, I don't think you even like won anything for it it was just like for the fun of it and you get exposure and they go like yeah good job you won well done um we were covering I think it wasn't it wasn't college starcraft but it was something similar like they had um companies that had like teams or something like that oh yeah after our gaming league yeah 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 um and so it was just fun starcraft and we we're having fun with it and i think we we also use that as an opportunity to kind of improve as a duo because we were like all right now that we thought we we would have a good shot at this it'd be a little bit embarrassing if we <laughs> didn't do too well so um it became a, i guess a bit of fun and a bit of practice um because we did sort of um i i want to use the word market although we didn't really do any marketing but we did sort of market ourselves as a duo like this is zepna this is you know, it's always us as a pairing <clears throat> at the time, excuse me. <clears throat> and uh yeah, I I we won and I think just I don't think we won by a lot either. It was like a few votes. <laughs> Cause it was like a they they voted each week, like or at least at the end, like who who should win or whatever in the head to head. Um but yeah, it was good fun. I totally forgot about that actually. <laughs> Yeah, Maynard brought it up recently, I think, on a backseat episode, so I was like, oh, I gotta ask her about it. I, it was still pretty cool. I mean, Day 9 wasn't even, like, directly involved, but I know Day 9, even yet still, is, like, pays attention uh, to StarCraft, and I think it was still kind of a uh, a senpai notice me moment for a lot of people who entered into oh, that. for me, for sure, dude. Like, <laughs> I love Day 9. I think he is the pinnacle of the of storytelling skill. I wish he did every event. Like I know, like at, at this stage, he's probably not the biggest analytical mind in StarCraft Two or anything. Um, but I, I just think he's so great to listen to, and he followed me on Twitter um, when we were doing that. <laughs> so you think good casting, and I was like, I've made it. That's it. <laughs> Day nine knows who I am. Yeah, uh, I've had similar uh, responses back then. It was more like the Korean commentators. If they ever noticed me, which. Happened once because I had a kitten on stream. Um, <laughs> still felt felt very senpai noticed me. But uh, it, I mean, yeah, yeah, as you were saying, it was a cool experience. Um, back then, we are talking about even kind of the smaller things being actually kind of a big thing. Like mm. uh, I did a crappy little URTL uh, team league, and nowadays it probably gets like forty viewers. Back then, I actually got like six hundred. You know, so um, there's just that height of, of StarCraft two popularity. So I feel like if you guys wanted to, there could have been some momentum in that, right? And certainly, you know, we we talked to Maynard uh, months ago at this point. He talked about his big leap into uh, casting in IEM, I believe. Yeah. So did you want to go for that? I mean, when you saw Maynard get those jobs, did you go like, oh, man, I really want to do that as well? Or was it always for you just a hobby? Um, That's a hard question, actually. I've asked myself that a lot, like whether... um trying to go to those international events was a goal or still is a goal of mine to do because obviously it'd be sick like who wouldn't want to do that right um but if you're going to do it you got to do it properly I can't I can't like part-time that or anything you know you've got to go ham on it and I think um you know a big part of Maynard and I as a duo sort of like splitting off a bit was when he ended up hosting um WCS 2012 when they actually came here and they brought HD pain user and tastosis in, and that was a big deal because like they were like yeah let's give this Australian guy the mic you know which is a risk when you're like Blizzard running a huge <laughs> tournament at the height of Starcraft and stuff um and I definitely saw that moment as like oh he's gonna make it you know he's gonna like keep 
getting better there because like i knew maynard i knew he was going to kill it he's very lovable very charismatic so um and and there was like space for that because not everybody's the hype guy on on a desk and stuff um and for me because by that point i think i graduated university in 2013 so i was already making that decision of like oh well now i have to get a real job and i was stepping back from casting um out of circumstance and so I kind of thought, like, if I really wanted to make that happen, which I wasn't sure if I would or if I even could, because um, Maynard's a gem and he would, like, tell people, he's like, oh, you should get Zeph on, you should get Zeph on. He'd put a good word in for me and I'd be like, oh, thank you, but that's a lot of pressure. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, like, I appreciated it, but I was like, man, could I actually do that? Um, and I still haven't figured out if it was like a, a goal, like I actually wanted to pursue it. I don't think it ever occurred to me to go full time in StarCraft, which I think you need to do if you want to pursue that um, sort of big international stage to cast on, unless you're like super dedicated like Fear Dragon and you somehow juggle a whole lot of casting with a full time job as well. Um, but yeah, I, do, I still don't really know the answer to that. I think yes, but also I wasn't like sweating it. Um, at the time, I thought uh, it would be cool to see a woman up there. Like I'm not usually too big on like, um, I, I, I don't care about like a diversity quota, right, uh, on the stage. But I was like, well, it'd be cool for like one of us to make it, right? Because I thought, you know, um, at the time, there was you and me in the scene. Uh, we were working on base trade. Gillyweed was in there doing player interviews for us and stuff. She was also great. Um, and the women that we did see in those hosting roles were people like um, Anna Prasa and um, Lauren Elise, who popped up for a minute, um, but yeah. no one on the like actual commentating bench. And I thought like it would be cool to have someone land on the bench. It doesn't have to be me. I just wanted to see someone do it. Um, so that was kind of in, in, in the back of my mind, like it would be cool if I could be first maybe. Um, but I just never really went anywhere with that, I guess. Um, even now, like I'm, I'm actually quite happy casting this region. I think I'm really lucky to do three different EPT regions now. Like I didn't think I would ever get to do another region. Um, yeah, even now I'm like, man, it would be cool to do like the big, show but I don't think it's something that I'm like actively pursuing anymore I just kind of accepted my lot as someone who has a career in something else at the same time hey it's a tough thing to even think about realistically I mean when it pops into your head it's kind of like thinking of being a football star right it's yeah. like yeah that would be pretty cool but like you know thousands hundreds of thousands of people want to do that so you know what, whatever whatever and um and I think our 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 lives were a little bit similar up to that point i guess i'm guessing we're the same same age because i also graduated in 2013 and uh similar situation of like you know i had free time so i was casting and so i got involved with basic tv and um i just kept doing it basically because it was convenient and because i had a freelance job on the side i was an artist so i'm used to freelance and low pay and <laughs> terrible working <laughs> conditions but so it really was like, but I, even me, like I had that point where I was like, okay, is this serious or not? I thought about teaching in Korea for a while, but it took me a long time to be basically like, is this serious? Even though for two years, I was kind of like ramping up and getting more more gigs and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, it's really hard to say at any point that one person, I think I've, I've talked to many casters and other casters talked to other casters. It's actually difficult to find someone who is like, yes this is what I'm going to do and then work towards that um, and actually get there. Right. It usually is yeah. kind of like, Oh, I'm just here. Oh, it would be kind of cool if I did even better. <laughs> yeah. Just kind of where it's, I found myself. So I think it's a hard decision to make though. Right. Cause like you said, you're committing to potentially very low pay, very long hours. Um, and there's no guarantee. Right. And you don't want to put in all your time and then find that you don't have it, whatever it is that makes a, um commentator that's going to get hired for big events and I think that was uh a factor in my decision making or lack thereof because I wasn't sure if I was good enough or could be good enough to cast with those kinds of people um and it it, it didn't it's not that it fell out of reach it was like 
bro, if you put me next to like Artosis or Rotterdam in control, doesn't matter who, I feel like I would look terrible in comparison. And so there's a big lot of work that needs to be done in the middle to whereby I don't think I'm going to do a bad job because if you get invited to an event and you don't perform, I think that's probably your last event or it's going to be really hard to sort of reinvent yourself enough to be like, no, 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 that was just a bad day. Like I actually am good, you know, because <laughs> there is a bit of competition, right? Everyone's trying to get hired for mm. these events. Um, I think there's a bit more to go around now. I don't, I don't know from your perspective if that's necessarily true, but just with the amount of StarCraft going on, I feel like they need more people to cover these ridiculous hours. But at the time, um, I don't know. I felt like I saw the same faces popping up because those were just the guys. That's, that's who did it. So if you wanted to crack into that, good luck. <laughs> I mean, you're absolutely right about that. Again, we kind of look at it like a historian would. But um, so Nate joined uh, what felt like very early, but back then felt actually like one of the newest faces, right? For mm. DreamHack something something. And um, he was the new guy until Fear Dragon came in, which was just three months before I came in, actually. So uh, four years, something like that. I mean, you're right. Like there was basically the same faces every yeah. time. Occasionally some older faces like Moonglade, for instance, right? Got a job for Pro League. But it was always kind of like this wonky, like, well, you get the Korean jobs that have kind of questionable work uh, hours and stuff like that. Yeah. And um, otherwise, it's the, it's the staples. So mm. you're definitely right about that. And then even before there was like the main, let's say, eight staples, let's you know, say, even before that, it was the most competitive because it was the only really big esport. So, yeah, it felt like if you didn't get it on the ground floor and then get into those gigs like an NASL or an MLG where you could just consistently hone your craft and then eventually make it to the big leagues, it felt like you had to go from here to jump up, mm. uh, which is a lot more intimidating as opposed to being like, well, I did a online cast and then I did a crappy little corner cast and then I did a MLG in-studio cast and then I was on the B stream in person. You know, there, there used to be yeah. more of kind of like a stepping uh, a ladder there than there is now, so... There's a lot of things to consider if you really wanted to go for it. And uh, I mean, as I said, it feels like kind of like a lot of stories just kind of based around luck or <laughs> I found myself here anyways. But yeah. um, no, I, I, I definitely think that the luck is a is a factor because um, mm. for me, like I feel like my whole casting career has been luck because there's not that many people here if uh moonglade and death still wanted to cast full time i think i'd quite honestly be out of a job because i think i get hired because you know like i do a, i do a decent job but they also don't need to teach me how to be in front of a camera for example like i know the people i know how it all works whereas when you have someone brand new you don't really know them they don't know you they don't know how um the whole show runs and they don't know how to have a producer in their ear and to talk to the camera and not fidget and you know all those things that you don't think about um that much because you know like you, you're used to doing it but you know people like death and moonglade who were pro players i think they're just natural ability and level of analysis is always going to be better quality than what i can bring so i feel like if they were like no we're doing this full time then like see you later zeph <laughs> like sorry this is the best lineup <laughs> with pig and maynard as well like you know maybe you can do the b stream um but yeah, I think it, it is a hard sort of stepping stone to even find the gigs that would give you enough credibility to step up that next level because there's only so many and they always look to, to the people that they know of at the very least or they'll check. I, I've noticed like because we have ANZ Champs weekend and that's live in studio here um, and they were looking for more casters and you know, I got asked the question, like, what do you think of this guy? What do you know about him or anything? I'm like, honestly, nothing, but he's probably going to be fine. Like, <laughs> you know, let's see how he goes. And then they asked me for feedback. Like, what did you think? Did he do okay? Like, it's like, yeah, well, you know, it's, it's fine. I had no problem. Um, but, you know, not everybody has an ANZ Champs weekend that they can hop into, which is basically like it's part of the main event, but it's just it's also kind of a sideshow at the same time. Yeah, I mean, it, it's pretty cool what you guys do with that um, to bring some, like, prestige to the the region mm -hmm. that, you know, like, yeah, a lot of other casual fans will just be like, what, that's happening? Oh, okay. You know, that, that actually gives a lot of credit when it's offline, even if it's really not that different. It's just, you know, 
I gotta admit that. So I, I've watched a couple. It's, it's pretty cool. And you had a guy that who was mostly CSGO, I, I think. Pilsky, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Pilsky, yeah. Um, he came on. We were like, oh, no. Like, what does he know? What is this? And he did fine. Oh, boy. So. I braced for that one as well. He's actually great. <laughs> um, so he he played into um, Heart of the Swarm and then he, mm. he stopped. But that did make me nervous as well because we all know how we feel about outsiders in StarCraft. Let's be real. It's when you say, like, oh, CSGO cast is going to be casting with you, like, what <laughs> are you sure because you're like oh my god what if they don't know anything you know like it's not the same thing cs go casting is very different to starcraft 2 casting but um he had a lot more experience than i thought he would have in starcraft so he, he's you know pretty natural and obviously he's also a professional commentator so which is something i didn't think about because i'm like oh you know he's he knows what he's doing. So like after the first set, I was like, oh, this is totally fine. I didn't need to worry at all. It's just my StarCraft prejudice coming through. Yeah. I mean, there is definitely a little bit of that. I'm very protective of our game and um, yeah. certainly very uh, proud, I guess, of how, how smart you have to be. <laughs> but uh, I, I do think that what I'm worried about when someone comes in and this hasn't happened basically, a, you know, a while, uh, you could argue like Creighton and Grant are kind of the new guys right now, yeah. but what what I would worry about is like, do they actually have that air of professionalism? Like there's professionalism in they don't say anything necessarily wrong and they can talk in full sentences. And then there's professional like actually working with their co-caster or, or filling a role when it needs to be filled or something like that. Um, which I think generally good commentators can do. Like if you're gonna plop uh like machine, like the, the CSGO caster and host machine down with me, I'd be like, oh, I'll probably be a better caster actually, because that guy's fucking good. Even if he doesn't know StarCraft that much. So I think it's an important feature, but it is unique to kind of your scene that you uh, you have these guys come on, I guess, right now for this season or last season as well. And you mentioned that you actually get talked to by your producers. Um, the what do you think of this guy and what did you think of that guy question? Mm. Uh, is that a common thing or is it really just this year? It's just this year because we had a, a couple of people in. I think they just, because they don't know, right? That these people aren't necessarily StarCraft people themselves. Some of them are, some of them aren't. Because um, they have a whole rotation of staff that work. Um, often when we're in the studio, CS goes running in another room. Um, maybe there's another game downstairs and stuff. So there's a lot of people and it's kind of like whoever's free jumps on the show when they get shown like this is how we run StarCraft. Um, and, you know, they put out a call uh, this season, I think, because um, they just they just got Pilly for us last time. They were like, oh, this guy, like we didn't have enough commentators. We needed someone that could come into studio, which eliminates Maynard because Rona and he can't travel and stuff. Um, so they got him for us. But in the most recent season they put out a call to be like hey if you know if anyone cast starcraft and you know about them you know like send me a thing say hello you know and so they that's the first time i've seen a call for casters in a long ass time in this region um so yeah obviously they got some responses there and um it, you know everyone's pretty willing to give uh new casters a fair go especially in this region you you need someone to come in and fill the role you know like have a shot and then we'll see how you go it's not so much a like um like a a report card on, on the person that we get but it's just like a making sure that we're happy with how the show went and how they perform because obviously if they're a disaster we need to <laughs> diplomatically say hey maybe they need a little bit more experience before they do this show again um so that it's just more checking in and being like, like he's good, right? You know, he did he did okay. You're happy with him? It's like yeah, yeah, he, like he's fine. Um, but it's just good to have that communication because um, I think you know uh, Maynard's definitely not shy, and I like to think I'm not if if I think it's impacting the show. Um, but we're not going to hold back if we think something's not going well um, or someone is not going well. Luckily, we haven't had to um say anything about the latter but um they're very open to feedback and how we want the show to work as well because oftentimes these are people coming from um broadcasting fps tournaments and they don't really know how starcraft runs like for example i think uh in the first season they wanted to do an interview after every single match and we were like well I mean, we could, but that's not really how it works in StarCraft. It doesn't make sense because it's like a group stage and not every match means everything. 
um you know so they they're really flexible which is good um and maybe that's just a, a byproduct of being a smaller region and we, we I feel like um we have a bit of a longer leash in terms of <laughs> what we can do sometimes compared to you guys I, I don't know how the other regions work but it definitely feels like we have a lot of say in how things should run within reason like obviously there's sponsor obligations and stuff and ad quotas and um you know we've got a timetable that we roughly need to stick to but the rest you know they're quite open to to rejigging it on the fly the uh the other side of things is actually pretty open as well i think the uh flexibility of working with dreamhack first of all but then also uh working online has actually been it's been pretty free um they they aren't too shy about asking us questions mm -hmm. and when we give them a little bit of shit for something that you know is kind of like it's necessary but not really like uh for example, the I don't know if you've watched the beginning of a broadcast this season, but they had the hosts bring up maps. Like this is a seven maps we'll be playing uh, yeah, this yeah. today. We have that too. <laughs> okay, yeah. So I don't know, but like, yeah, their, their reasoning for it is not great. Um, they want more graphics, which maybe I shouldn't be elaborate about, but whatever. And uh, I I know like Worry was like okay like I guess I'll do it and he's you know done a couple of like neat you know funny things about it making fun of summary and all that type of stuff but I know other people <laughs> myself included have kind of given a little bit of shit to the producer being like you're gonna do maps again and they're like oh yes please and we're like but do we have to yeah. I mean come on and then you know, they'll laugh but they still make us do it <laughs> but no it's pretty flexible actually. Uh, which I think has really helped. And I think that's also important for bringing any new talent that is going to come in to help cover the hours is that there is a nice environment uh, for them to do so. Kind of speaking of feedback, though, so fortunately, never had to give negative feedback about a specific person. That is always the best case scenario. Do you, did you, or do you, uh, do you feedback on yourself? Um, do you ask other pastors for feedback or what's your process for improving? Um, I just go off my own stuff. Um, I very much believe that you are your own worst critic. And so long as there are things that I'm unhappy with, um, I know what I need to work on. Uh, I think, I don't, I don't know how other people feel, like probably not, not like this, but I'm very, very rarely happy with my casts. Um, I think my first season of EPT was decent because... Um, I had been watching a lot of StarCraft. I was just one in one of those StarCraft moods where I was just like consuming it all. I knew what was going on. And so I didn't have to scramble before the season started to like get my head in the game and understand what's going on and stuff. So um, giving myself a lot more time, I found I did a lot better and I had a lot more fun because I wasn't stressing so much about like what I need to prepare for in the next broadcast and, and everything like that. Um, but most of the time, I feel like I barely scrape okay or like possible in my cast. I'm not happy with the level of it. Um, so there's some things that I'm like consistently trying to work on. For example, like the biggest one's probably my game knowledge because when you have limited time to commit to the game, I'm never going to know as much as um, a full timer. And so when I'm paired with Pig and Maynard all the time who do this full time and they, they get a lot more practice in and a lot of more visibility of games. And uh, obviously they have huge brains. Pig, Pig in particular knows everything under the sun. Um, I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to sound extra dumb if I'm you know not on the ball here. And I think another difficulty I've had is like... Um, when I started, I modeled myself very much as an analysis. That's what I wanted to do. And that worked really well as a duo with Maynard because Maynard is loud, he's hype, he's charismatic, he's funny. I'm not those things. I'm a lot more <laughs> low-key than Maynard. So it was really easy. But now, because Maynard's full-time, um, he knows more than I do. So I'm like, well, I can't be analysis because it doesn't make sense because he knows more, but I'm also not able to do hype because I think my voice is annoying if I'm hyping but I do try and fall a little bit more into play by play than I used to and I don't really feel like I have a role anymore so it took me to figure out how best I can complement my co-caster whoever that may be so there's things like that that I try and work on because in my head I'm just like that was bad that was awkward you said something dumb there uh you stumbled too much in that intro 
you said the wrong thing here and it just it sticks to my brain like you wouldn't believe it's just I have a long list after every broadcast of everything I screwed up so in that sense I feel like I don't need feedback because I'm sitting there like grinding my teeth at my own performance um way back when it was mostly Maynard and I casting together we would work together on how to improve so we'd be like all right well we want really high energy intro so let's figure out how to structure it and you know how to take it so we start off with a bang um we maybe like reassess and then we'll be like what do we reckon about our energy levels here though uh, is it good could we take it up a notch you know like and so we'd sort of check in like that it wasn't so much like you screwed that up or um <laughs> don't do that i don't like it it was more like how can we do a better show um but that's probably the last time i ever bothered to get feedback from um anyone else i did speak to kylaris at one point when i was still casting a lot more just to get an idea of what other people do like the actual pro casters doing the circuits so i was like what do you guys do for feedback because i was curious if there was some magical thing i was missing out on like group feedback <laughs> sessions or something and he sort of gave me a bit of um insight into his approach and what he's experienced um but yeah i'm not really one to reach out to anyone i think if i was at a level where i was consistently pretty happy with how i casted then i would seek um outside feedback because at that point you don't know what you're doing wrong anymore um and i don't know if you watch yourself but i find that very excruciating i'd rather someone else just tell me <laughs> what i'm what i'm doing wrong um but yeah cuz i i don't i don't have reddit i don't have tl i don't uh read twitch chat so I'm really just hanging out with myself in this space at the moment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's like so many things you touched on that, you know, I've learned over these, these episodes and it's like, definitely attack the problem, never attack each other, you know, kind of like a uh, couple's counseling, <laughs> when it, you know, you have, what can I be more hype and not you have to be more hype type of thing. Yeah. Um, and then feedback, I think you can get it from uh, general public basically, but you have to be very like, very careful i think enough people say x it might be true but of yeah. course if like only okay. a couple say it then don't don't really sweat it and then yes i also hate uh watching myself but i have done it a couple of times especially when it came to uh progressing onto uh more on camera like studio work uh i was like i don't want to look like i have to have two mugs in my hands and be like what do i do yeah <laughs> so i tried to work on that but yeah, it's it's so much more. I agree with you. Like I know the big mistakes, and if I felt particularly proud of myself or just in a very <laughs> confident mood, maybe I'd be like, "Can you point out things that I would miss?" But basically, I know when I fucked up, and I don't feel like having someone tell me that again <laughs> when I when I'm just like, "Remember it and don't do it again." Yeah, I think there's. Um, I think it's hard to pick who to give you feedback. Anyway, like. Um, I reckon I'd probably go to Maynard because he can be pretty blunt and he knows I wouldn't get offended, or at least I like to think he knows that. But um, he's also very like overly fair, like too fair. He'd be like, no, you did fine. Like maybe you could do this, but you know, like it's fine. It's, it's whatever, you know. And so it's hard to sometimes get feedback from somewhere because it, people don't want to upset you. They don't want to um, necessarily have an opinion on you either. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't even really know where I would want to go for that. I'd probably rely on a couple of people that I already know in the scene, um, that I think would tell it to me straight, but yeah, it's, it is like, you need the confidence to do that. Right. Because you need to be able to take it. <laughs> if you're having a bad day, it's not when you want to hear how yeah. good or badly you went. Oh, shoot. I was going to. You said that, and I was like, "Yeah, don't be like Deer Dragon, who um goes to for feedback on his on his negative days." <laughs> you were talking about before that uh, who you would go to. That's right, and yeah. I do think Maynard's a great person to go to. And this might be um something that you can't relate to, but I do feel like the Australian accent makes you feel a little bit better. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever he starts off a, a sentence with "I reckon," I'm like, "Oh." that's nice." <laughs> Even if it's yeah. like "I reckon you fucking suck," I'd be like, "Oh, okay." <laughs> And then uh, I do think that the whole feedback thing, it, it does put a little bit more onus on the person giving you feedback. So you as the person asking also have to be very crafty. It's not just the person trying not to make you feel bad about yourself, but you also have to 
give a lot of ease you know you have to ask specific questions you have to be very clear with what you want and yeah no stuff. for sure because I think um how did I do for example is a very broad question it's like well well with what because I've, I've been asked that myself recently by other people be like uh how did that go I'm like good it was it was fine but I don't like <laughs> it's not specific enough it's like how do you encapsulate the entire thing um <clears throat> I try and think of what I do for other people um because usually it's like a, a lot of the time the feedback I'm giving people is to do with being in front of the camera because they haven't done that before so I'm like don't fidget mic cord behind you um talk to the camera don't be looking out there or, you know like just watch think about how you come across and try and project your confidence and stuff um but those are like really quick wins right they're they're really easy to point out whereas um if you go up to someone you're like how did I do with this or that it makes it a bit easier for them to understand what you're talking about but they it's not like they may not necessarily know like they may not have paid that much attention to what you're doing so it's like you're also kind of asking for someone's time and effort to have a proper look at what you're doing and I think um yeah it, it makes it a little bit tricky because I I heard one story I can't remember who it was but it was uh they got feedback that they weren't really looking for because it was like feedback appropriate for a play-by-play -play caster but they were analysis and they were like well I mean like thanks but that's not really my role but like I get where you're coming from but that's not what I do so I kind of feel like it doesn't make sense I think feedback is just it's tricky all around right like you don't have yeah. a performance review everyone has a different opinion on how to do things so um, you have to take it all with a grain of salt I guess um, that's a very good point about the play-by-play -play versus an analytical thing I mean it kind of even goes along the lines of like if you were to get feedback from a general person they might not also consider uh like what the producers would want right like if your feedback is you guys I'm trying to think of something that's not stupid like you guys take too many breaks um <laughs> <laughs> you guys don't stare at the camera enough or something like that yeah. um you know a response could be well that's actually what we're being told to do so more like, better advice please you don't <laughs> you're not the exactly the person I would go to because uh, you don't know what's happened behind the scenes. And that's true for like the two dynamics as well. Um, you know, I think you should have been more hype here where really, if you're an analytical person, maybe the feedback should be, I think you could have left more room for the play by play guy to swoop in uh, as yeah. opposed to being like, well, you should just take on the hype and take the most momentous moment uh, away from the guy who's, who's paid to do it. So very important stuff to talk about. And uh, I kind of wanted to bring it back as well to the role dynamics because you you brought up a very interesting point, which is that you don't quite know what role you're taking. Um, I mean, my first question is, do you think that it actually is paramount that you have a play-by-play -play and you have an analytical caster? Does it have to always be the, those two? No, I don't, I don't think it has to be that black and white. Um, I think it helps if you have a strength. So you are more analytical than you are play-by-play -play because then it helps figuring out a pairing with someone, right? It would make more sense to put Maynard with Pig than um, put who who else does high like I don't Maynard and Fear Dragon Maynard, Maynard and Fear Dragon yeah Brayton, like, it, like that makes a little less sense than Maynard Pig because then you you have both bases covered and like you're never gonna keep everyone in the audience happy right so I think it's good to have two different styles anyway because you know then you have hopefully something for everybody because um, I think there is something to be said about like how approachable starcraft is for people even with casters on the desk explaining what's going on so i think you know having a bit of mix is is good i think um i think it helps but i i think it's more valuable to be able to fit multiple roles as well um because especially if you want to be the next caster at blizzcon you can't be like well i only do analysis sorry it's not how it works you need to be able to do multiple things and a lot of the time you'll be learning it on the job which is you know how it is but um yeah I don't I don't think you have to have uh one or the other I think it's good to have people that can do a mix of both because you know it's not like you're only analyzing 100% of the time either sometimes it's appropriate for you to get hype just so that you can throw it to the other person and have them already at the energy level that needs to be there so they're not going from like my asmr commentary on the drone <laughs> count to like screaming about banely explosions you know 
Yeah, it's a, I agree. I, I think that there's you know, been examples in the past of like two of the uh, the play by play or two of the analysts doing well together. Like uh, Maynard and Tasteless, I think, are a very, very fun cast. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I enjoy it you know, thoroughly. Or uh, one of my first uh, big surprises was that I worked well with, with Rotterdam. Now, everyone works well with Rotterdam, I would argue. But, anyways, I was surprised because I was like, oh no, like I'm kind of coming here as the analyst. That's definitely more what I was pushing myself for <clears throat> four years ago, five years ago, whatever it was. So, but it can work. But yeah, having the ability to do both, I think, makes you a better commentator for both styles uh, anyways. And that's also what I brought up now. I think being a host makes you better and being an interviewer mm. makes you better and blah, blah, blah. Just general stuff on camera <laughs> is probably going to make you uh, make you better. Yeah. It lets you be a bit of a jack of all trades. And I think yeah, understanding what the other person's role is makes you allows you to make better choices in terms of um, how you throw back to them. You know, do you give them a leading question to, to run with? Um, do you start bringing up the energy so that they can take it all the way? Or, you know, th those sort of things help just to have better chemistry with no matter, like, w with anyone that you're paired with because you don't necessarily get to choose, right? They have a show. They have certain people that they want on certain matches. So, um, yeah, I'm always a fan of basically trying to fit everywhere at once if you can obviously you're going to be stronger at some things and others but it's just um it's a better way to go and i i didn't realize really that it, some people saw it as uh you know how there were distinct roles in the cast because i got asked recently by uh someone i was casting with so what kind of cast are you and i was like what, what do you mean <laughs> and they were like like so do you do play by play or are you analysis and i'm like it's, well it's not really that binary for me actually i just i fit whatever it is don't worry about what my role is versus your role is let's just try and have a conversation and make it entertaining rather than put you in a box and that's where you sit now yeah i think it also comes down to sometimes the people who do come from different esports uh i think different esports have more rigidity um mm. you know more suit and tie productions and just the way that the casting has developed for them has been very professional and I think some people also do fit better when they have a role, like it just makes them comfortable, right? So that's also a reason why they could be asking. And then also the pacing of different games is so much different, right? Because I think, um, you know, I talked with the Overwatch caster, Lemon Kiwi, and she was like utterly shocked that we don't pair ourselves. We do everything and everyone. <laughs> um, so, you know, to have two play by plays wouldn't make much sense for Overwatch with the way that, that that flows and the way you have to have such synergy, I guess, with your co casters because it's a fucking insane game. But I think it works very well in StarCraft 2. Um, the very mm -hmm. casual nature and just two people enjoying a game of StarCraft together um, has been my preference, which is why I'm casting StarCraft and not something else, right? Um, but I feel like it also makes us a very, an oddly accepting crowd when it comes to commentators like if i can have a good time with you on a broadcast i'm going to give you a thumbs up i don't necessarily care if you're not doing the best play-by-play -play or if you don't really know a whole lot about the analysis but if i'm having a fun time then the audience is probably having a fun time as well that's usually what it comes down to so um yeah uh you mentioned that you were doing a little bit more play-by-play -play, trying to be a little more of the jack of all trades here um did you go into any of the seasons this year saying like, I'm going to do that? Was that something on your mind or did it just kind of kind of naturally? Yeah, it just sort of happened. Um, particularly when I don't know enough to be comfortable trying to make a, make a shot at analyzing properly. Like I mentioned earlier, you know, PVP was a struggle for me for a while. I think I'm a bit better at it now. Um, but I'm also casting very wild PVPs in like Taiwan, Hong Kong and China. So like analysis, mm, it's questionable at the best of times. Um, but you know, if I, if I hit something where I'm not sure, then I'll back off a little bit. Cause chances are having pig and Maynard with me, they're going to know. Um, so maybe it's less that I take a stab at it and more that I ask the question and let them run with it instead. Um, but it's also something that I wanted to improve on because, uh, I think I'm finally getting better at it, but I used to stumble over my words a lot. Um, and that's a problem because for play-by-play, uh, play, you inevitably sometimes have to get a little hype. But we have female voices. And <laughs> I don't know about you, but when I get excited, my voice goes up. 
no one wants to listen to that I don't want to listen to that it's it's hard so you have to <laughs> I feel like be a lot more controlled and um you can for example you know you start speaking a little faster you emphasize differently your words but I found that I was always stumbling and I was like I really need to get rid of that because that's not good in any context play by play or whatever you don't want to be stumbling over your words constantly um so it was something that I was just trying to improve on a little bit but it also just made sense to do considering who I'm casting with and um it depends a little bit on my on the level of knowledge that I feel like I possess coming into an EPT broadcast like if I think I'm good I understand most things then you know I'll maybe uh try and speak a little bit more to what's happening and why in the game than just pointing out the production tab or you know what, what what's going on there so yeah I think it just sort of happened naturally but you know, it sounds like you you say you're improving, so you must be some thought process uh, process during the improvement. Do you do you have anything you could pinpoint? Like, is it just repetition that's helping you most, or is it the conscious mm-hmm. you know thought that's put into it? I think it is just um, is two things I think that have helped. Is first of all um, remembering to breathe properly um because I also tend to have this is very good posture for me right now but I also tend to have pretty nerd posture at at the table I'm very slouched uh, or I'm very hunched over like I tend to put my elbows on the desk and that doesn't leave a lot of room for you to inhale as much as you could and then let that that flow properly because breathing turns out is very important especially when you're trying to Um, spit out a lot of information in an energetic fashion Um, and the other thing was just trying to think about what I want to say for a second before I say it like usually when my co-caster is speaking I'm starting to formulate what I'm going to say next in advance and that seems to cut down a little bit on the amount of stumbling that's happening for me and also on the uh um yeah so uh you know that sort of filler <laughs> sounds that just happen and you're like oh god that sounds so bad when you listen back you're like oh why do I keep saying that all those fallback phrases that you um uh oh I mean all casters have them that you fall back on like uh oh it'll be interesting to see if like how many times you say that in a cast for example yeah so um just trying to eliminate some of those and being aware of it has helped a lot in just planning what I'm going to say in advance I found recently, as I really try and study this stuff, that variety is actually a critical component to how good of a of a play by play I think it, it you know the section was or the caster is. Um, I actually listen to the variety of uh, phrases and words, and I'm not talking like being a walking thesaurus, but I think that's one of the things that Maynard is not given credit for because people just don't generally think about it. But I think Maynard has a lot of turn of phrase. Like he has a lot of different ways to say something, um, which which really can add to the hype. So yeah, yeah. it's a good thing to focus on. I think that helps a lot as well, because I find um, another thing I'm trying to work on is uh, that time feeling that you have at the very beginning of the game where nothing's happening for like the first three ish minutes until someone drops some tech and then you say that. But then now you still got to wait till the drop happens or something. And, and then, you know, you can go from there. And when it's your six tvp for the night and you're like what new things can i say about this matchup on this map with these players it can be a bit difficult once you run out and i hate that like my job is to talk i shouldn't be struggling to come up with something new and interesting to say um and i don't want to be repetitive saying the same thing about the matchup or or the players every time so (laughs) i don't i still haven't got a good solution for that on a long broadcast but um it is that sort of turn of phrase stuff and mixing it up a little bit that I think helps disguise sometimes that you might be saying similar stuff to what you've already uh covered in the in the previous maps Mm -hmm. absolutely I also think that's where you would look to tastosis right like that's where the, the the banter really can can help Yes. The problem with that is that as soon as you try to be friends with your friend, your co caster is probably someone you know and have got with a ton of as soon as you like try and bring that out, people are like, You're not tastosis. Like stop trying to be funny. Like, what are you doing? Hundred <laughs> percent. So, Every time. <laughs> it's like there's not really a like perfect solution. 
yeah i think the same thing because what i did was i went and looked at what do other people do well they talk shit and they make jokes and stuff now i'm not funny which sucks <laughs> i wish i was comic relief um you know may not very much is which helps a lot because he can just roll with it and he just invents ridiculous scenarios and it's funny but i just i don't have that skill but that makes it a lot easier too but yeah i always see the um it's even in the back of my mind like what are you doing you're, you're not funny you're not tasty just give it give it a rest you know like because <laughs> i always wonder like are people cringing at this in the background like is it really not funny to them but it's only funny to me because it's such a subjective thing right yeah it's hard yeah. to nail down I uh one of the toughest things the realities of being funny I think is actually trying to be funnier is probably the harshest um you have to do it and fail to be better at it that I've experienced you know like that's the general thing you're going to fail before you get good at something I find being funny to be the worst but most important example of you have to fail multiple times cuz if you fail a test, no one really cares. You get better later. If you fail a joke on a broadcast, there is like the fucking crickets. And <laughs> yeah. you cringe inside and you're like, well, I took my shot. That wasn't right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, but I think that's actually what you have to do. And, you know, some of the funniest people in the scene, you know, Maynard or, or in control back in the day, like they had their failures that they were very you know graceful in their failure they would, they would get out of it pretty quickly but yeah. but they had their failures but they had tens of uh, hundreds of thousands of failures long before we did that made them the funny guys they are yeah <laughs> so i try to keep that in mind whenever i fail um which you know happens a bit because i don't think i'm naturally funny either i always look at the guys i i'm like hanging out in korea with manard and tasteless and i'm just like oh my God, I can't hold a fucking candle to these guys. Jesus Christ. Like, I just yeah. can't. I just watch them in awe. It's hard. It's hard. And you don't want that moment where you fall flat and you think about that for the next week because it <laughs> sticks. And you're like, I can't believe I said that. <laughs> it's yeah. so tough. Like most people probably forgot, but you're there like, oh God, it was so bad. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Oh gosh. Um, You know, one of the last, last, uh questions from me you mentioned that, you know, like, oh, we have the female voices, which um, I, I totally resonate with. I've tried improving my voice through multiple means uh, so that I I could almost guarantee that if you compared my voice to when I was uh, 22, uh, it'd be deeper. Right. Um, and that's something to do with age. But I also think it's just like a an effort on my part to do that. But uh, have you ever like looked into ways to controlling your voice? Have you ever thought about doing voice acting or just uh, ways to get more comfortable with your voice? yeah I have um I I considered doing like uh audiobooks for a bit but then I heard like your experience of doing audiobooks and I was like oh I'm not sure that sounds like the funnest thing anymore <laughs> um but yeah I I did look into it a little bit um not just for Starcraft but for public speaking in general because um doing casting helped me do public speaking which helped me be a better caster which helps me be a better public speaker <laughs> and so on and so forth um and uh I was trying to think of like practical tips that I could give other people that have nerves presenting um because like in a work context you got to do that sometimes on how to help them out with that um and that led me to go down the path of well what is there that I don't know about how to control your voice and how to improve the tone, um, how to control the pitch of it better? And it put me firmly in the part of YouTube where everyone's doing like singing instructions and you know vocal coaching for a singing context. I actually haven't found anything worthwhile, particularly for voice acting. It's more like, oh, own your voices. Don't like, don't try and do another character's voice and stuff I'm like I'm not doing voices here I'm using my <laughs> voice and I just want to be clearer I want to ensure that my voice doesn't die in the middle of the cast and all that sort of stuff um but most of what I got out of that was breathing exercises um so taking the deep breath and that helps with nerves as well um so pushing from your diaphragm because I found that uh in long cast if I wasn't doing that properly my throat would start to get tight which made my voice sound tighter on the cast, which I didn't realize actually came through till till I forced myself to listen one time. 
Um, and I find that when my voice gets tired, I get squeakier as well. So if I try and be hype, it's like even if I'm trying not to go too high pitch, it sort of just it takes on a gross tone that I don't like. So, um, yeah, it was a lot around breathing and also looking at how uh, singers sing high notes without straining their voice. Because I'm like, well, I don't want to go high, but like, how do you not go high when you're excited? Because that's just naturally what happens. And uh, they have this concept of singing down. So you try and envision like a neutral position for your throat bit. I can't remember what it's called. Is it larynx? I don't know. The bit that like moves up and down your, where your voice box is. Yeah. Um, they're like envision speaking like down into it and singing down so that you maintain that neutral uh, open throat position. And they also talk a lot about enunciation um and trying to have the most relaxed throat and jaw muscles and everything that you can because I do tense my jaw in general that's just a feature of my being apparently um but I do it when I cast you and I get I get like tired here because you have the headphones pressing in there and you're also tense so um it was a lot of looking into ways that you relax and try and um keep your voice at that natural level that you speak at rather than going up or down necessarily just it's all about being in a neutral not the way that they say it but neutral throat position is what what I think about (laughs) um so yeah I went through that I would love to find someone that actually has proper like vocal coaching for like just voice work um and see what they what wisdom they have to share but uh that's what I got for now a whole lot of singing youtube videos it's it is a lot of crossover like i've done the voiceover um voice over coaching and then i also transitioned to voice acting coaching and i also would like to learn how to sing just because it's something i've always you know kind of like felt embarrassed about but also i know it would help me like all those things are definitely connected but yeah you can definitely search for voiceover coaches they kind of market their expertise to people like um like public speakers, basically, people going for TED Talks or people who are going to be talking to like a board of directors. Um, so when I, I first found my voice over, my voice, just general voice coach, I guess. Um, yeah, he was very interested in what I was doing and he, he found an approach that worked. But he was like, you should also just really consider voice acting. Because um, again, all those things are going to mix together and help. But basically, a lot of what he talked about was a lot what you talked about. So the whole cliche of like, don't change your voice, just, you know, be proud of your voice, find your voice. It's, it's actually yeah. true. Yeah. It's kind of silly, but, um, you know, I, I say this for casting in general as well, but you're not being a fake you, but you're being kind of like 110% of you, right? Like, you know what I mean? I think that's also the kind of thing that happens with your voice when you start to get comfortable with it. Yeah, I think um, another thing for me was just, attempting to project confidence at all times even if that's not necessarily how you feel because you fool the audience and you will eventually relax right you can't be tense that whole damn time or at least I can't maybe maybe some people can which is unfortunate but um yeah just trying to project confidence and slow down a bit so I find that with the whole thing of trying not to stumble over my words I'm thinking what I'm saying beforehand I'm trying to sound confident I'm trying to project because I have quite a quiet voice as well I found like it's not quiet to me but they're always like you put me and Maynard next to each other they put me up on like volume 11 and they put Maynard down on volume one I'm like oh Zef you're still a little bit quiet I'm like projecting so hard into the microphone um so yeah I think I think you nailed it like it is a combination of all things uh put together it's it's a mix of not only the act of speaking but how you present yourself and um the physical aspects of it as well that you know I think um I think it's important like I think everyone should look into it at some point because it will help you even if you're not a caster like being able to communicate effectively is a, a very very critical skill to have um but yeah I mean if you got some value out of it I feel like I'm a little bit more inclined to pursue it and just see what what they come up with is that something you still do or is it like you do a few sessions and I haven't gone back to a a voiceover coach um, since I finished uh, my uh, program, I guess you would say, program. Um, 
like a year ago. So, but I did find it very helpful. Um, and then what it comes down to now is just kind of remembering what they taught me. So, you know, there was a time at like Katowice, which in general, I wasn't like super proud of my Katowice performance. I just felt like every day was a little bit cursed. And then, you know, some COVID happened and I felt really cursed. But <laughs> um, I remember I was casting with Pig and afterwards I was just like shaking my head, being angry at myself. And Pig's like, what, what's wrong? Like, it was fine. And I was like, I, I, I shrieked. Like, what? <laughs> and I was like, I was play by playing and I, I, I lost control of my voice. And I, I hate that because so many of my formative years of being a commentator was being afraid of being the woman on the broadcast, which is a very, yeah. like, we understand the problem, but it is kind of like a, one of those, like, inherent kind of subconscious, like, sexist things to say, like, but and, and not to get too deep here, but yeah, you don't want to be annoying on the broadcast. Yeah. So going into the and then the bailings <clears throat> and then the yeah. bailings. Um, <laughs> yes. Yeah. You don't want to be that 100%. person. So it comes yeah. down to a lot of uh, remembering that. But you're absolutely right. I actually advise it for everyone in communication. Um, I think if you find the most, the people you listen to the most and the people that you find the funniest, like they're going to share a lot of the same qualities when it comes to how they present their voice and their posture that presents their voice. You know, the people who literally fill a room with their voice. Yeah, um, hard not to pay attention to. Yeah, I think it it is helpful. We talk a lot about watching yourself as a feedback mechanism as casters. I think, and it is painful. But I think watching other people as well helps. If you if you can emulate what someone else is doing a little bit, that might help you discover new ways of expressing yourself or improving the way that you speak. Because for me, like I saw, I mentioned earlier, Day9 is just the best. And he has that, uh, I don't know if you ever watch his YouTube, but he has Day9 story times um, on his channel. And they're so good and they're so funny and interesting. But if you break it down, he's kind of almost like talking about very minor things that happen in his day or in his life and stuff but the way that he expresses it makes it into this grandiose funny tale um so that's something that i looked at a little bit to understand like what makes day nine storytelling day nine storytelling like, where does that come from i did the same thing um i think who was it i think it was artosis i was like how does artosis do his analysis like how does he deliver it and then how does that work with tasteless when he takes it from there just seeing how other people do it can sometimes help you a little bit in terms of just how you structure your delivery of things as well may not work for everyone again you don't want to like copy someone because they're already there right you don't want to be them but yeah I don't know it's just it's such a melting pot of things to find the best way forward to improve your own vocal work um but yeah, I I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. Maybe maybe it's different for everybody in terms of how to improve on that. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. But I do think that we've touched on a lot of things. I mean, coaching is absolutely something that you can do. I feel like some people have like a really bad impression of coaching like in general. Like it's only acceptable if you're five years old in the soccer team. But uh, no, coaching is almost always, um, you know, going to help you. And then, uh, yeah, studying from others. Absolutely. Uh, watching your own VODs, absolutely experimenting, basically doing the maybe, you know, initially your own voice. Maybe it's a little nasally, like, but you can sometimes own it and it works out fine. Then trying to actually, uh, you know, control that issue could be the way forward. Like, yeah, it is a lot of experimenting, as is most things when it comes to what the uh, soft arts, like, whatever you want to call it, the not, you know, hard yes. numbers, hard facts. Um, just a lot of, a lot of figuring it out as you go, I guess. So, um, yeah, excellent suggestions. I, uh, I agree very much so with everything you've, you've discussed. You've brought up um, the idea of improving, which uh, it's hard to consolidate. But um, I have one last question for you, and it's from uh, Patreon. So, awesome. Kind of jump in topics here. Uh, what would the StarCraft II event of your wildest dreams be? So, all the money and anywhere and not COVID. <laughs> uh, oh, boy. <laughs> That's a good question. I'd run it here to be selfish, to be honest. I, I'd want it mm, in Sydney or Melbourne. Either one's good, to be honest. Um, and I would probably want it to be like a BlizzCon esque thing, like not, um, not multiple stages with different games or anything. Just like pure 
StarCraft elitism <laughs> and just, you know, all star lineup. I'd like it to be like a huge event, you know, like multiple days. Um, people can roll in and out, big audience, just like fly all the players out, make it a success. I think the problem with those big events coming here is that it's so expensive to get everyone here so if you have all the money in the world that solves a huge problem <laughs> we can have a stadium we can have the most lit stage of all blizzcons ever um we could just fly in all the players and all the commentators under the sun it would be it would be the best and also this is just because i love eating i would make it like not convention food you know not the like four dollar <laughs> slab of greasy pizza i would make it like super good catering yeah yeah uh, you know blizzcon actually had pretty good catering if i um my one experience there they had i i could you not they had a um the regular catering which was like i think it was outside of the convention maybe not but it was actually pretty decent so like uh, american fair i guess you would say and then they had literally the other side of the room was all korean food oh like the best yeah, I don't know who at what year was like, you can't keep feeding these 12 Koreans. <laughs> this, this, you know, mashed potatoes and, and meatloaf, but <laughs> I loved them for it because I was always on the other side uh, eating. So that's a very good point. People don't usually bring that up. Plus, it helps with your casting to not literally be eating fat and cheese and uh, whatever else. Yeah, shit they it's give you. something I learned actually from a, a play around here. Um we went to an event and we just ducked over to the supermarket, all the players and everyone just to get snacks for the day. And everyone's buying chips and Gatorades and Coke cans and all this sort of stuff. And there's one player buying bananas and apples. And I was like, that's actually so smart. I don't know why we're all in here with choice of any food, buying the junk food that is not going to deliver you your peak performance. Let's be real. It's just going to make your insides hurt later. Um, and since then, just observing that, I'm like, no, I am taking my own food and I'm going to have healthy food because it's, you know, it's the whole holistic health experience. You know, you want to deliver your best cast. You don't want to be fueled on purely chips and gross pizza from around the corner or wherever they order it in from. Yeah, I don't you know. A couple of my best casts have been done on like two hours of sleep and no food. So like, I don't know. I I can't relate. <laughs> I feel like if I eat something greasy, I become greasy, and people can see that I've you know cheese oh, is no. coming out of my pores or something. It's like yeah, so <laughs> just imagine being on camera and you like wave your hand. There's like Cheeto dust on. <laughs> That's what <laughs> it feels like. Make a artist didn't notice. Um, no, I actually completely agree. I have this thing where if I eat, I have like 30 minutes of like coughing and like disgusting like you know clearing my throat sound so i actually like don't eat during cast if i can help it oh that so, makes sense yeah i'm with you uh 100 i feel like a lot of it is also the the age of the players um versus like the age of the the, the casters a lot of the time because i feel like casters as far mm. as i've known them the last four years have been part of like the crew they've always been like please love god don't be convention food but uh players That's coming in at like 18 they don't seem to really care yeah, we're old now. We, <laughs> we, yeah, we need to we're eat properly. Old <laughs> and have our specifics and are trying to think about our future. I don't know. Yeah, lame stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyways, I think that's an excellent event. I uh, I would maybe say also another uh, Ozcraft would be fucking amazing. Just That uh, would be great. Yeah, have that BlizzCon event at that house and I'm there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we need a bigger mansion for sure. Uh, yeah the biggest be a lot of people yeah that would be really cool i really hope we can do another ozcraft and get some more lands coming in um yeah. once this is all blown over of course but uh yeah it'd be great just to i just want the australian scene to be able to mingle a little bit more you know <laughs> it's uh i think i think we're doing all right these days um we do get you know one to two representatives over there and people starting to know us a little bit more thanks to maynard and pig also you know, hitting hitting the big time. So, yeah, we can only hope, right, that this is uh, back to normal esports programming soon. Yep, and that's uh, you know, StarCraft Two will still be, uh, I guess, improving and, and getting bigger and better, which it feels like it still is doing. Um, yeah. ESL obviously has put a lot of faith in us, so you know, two more years, yeah, I'll see what can happen. 
thank you so much for joining me again. And if you want to do any shout outs as well as where people might be able to find you in the future, please do them now. Yeah, no, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me on. It's good fun. Um, you can find me on Twitter at ZephSE2. I'm bad at social media. Uh, I actually don't stream, which is, I feel like I'm the only cast that doesn't actually stream as well. But yeah, uh, hit me up on Twitter if that's uh, that's up your alley. A whole lot of Australian StarCraft is mostly what I'll be tweeting about. Um, but yeah, that's all. Thanks for having me on. Okay, awesome. I hope you guys enjoyed the podcast. Consider checking out the Patreon, and uh, I'll see you guys for episode 19. Bye.